Chapter 4. Who He Is and Who We Are One exhortation of scripture I long to keep far better than I do is this wonderful charge. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12, 1-2 As I fight my way through the battles of this world, my eyes aren't normally fixed on Jesus. I do look his direction more than I used to, but far more often my eyes are fixed on the crisis before me. They have a way of arresting my attention. A dear friend is currently in a heinous battle with cancer. It has been waged over years now, and I cannot tell if we are in the final hours or not. Only God knows the number of prayers that have gone up for him. It feels like the number of stars in the heavens. This morning we received a turn of bad news and immediately went to prayer. But I did not feel confident and assured. I certainly did not feel triumphant. I wasn't expecting a cloud the size of a man's fist rising from the sea. I felt discouraged and distressed. My gaze was fixed on his suffering, not upon the resources of the living God. And oh, what a difference it made. There is a beautiful scene in the third of the Hobbit trilogy of films, The Battle of the Five Armies. The dwarves and Bilbo have in fact awakened the dragon Smog from his slumbers. The beast is enraged that anyone would dare challenge his stolen kingdom. Lashing out with indiscriminate vengeance, Smog swoops down upon the unsuspecting village of Lake Town, breathing fire and death with every pass. In moments, the wooden township is engulfed in flames. One man dares to rise against him, the bowman Bard. While the hamlet rages and the rest of the townsfolk flee, Bard climbs to the top of the bell tower and begins to fire arrows as the murderous beast passes by. But the armor of smog is impenetrable, like tenfold shields, save only by a black arrow from the elder days. Bard's son Bane knows this, and he knows where the last black arrow lies hidden. As Bard takes his final shot and the wooden arrow bounces off the dragon's armor, Bane appears in the tower with what might be a miracle. Smog detects the movement, and while the inferno that was once Lake Town rages round him, the scaled malice turns his full attention on the two figures in the tower. Is this your child? The bloody monster licks his lips as he advances. You cannot save him from the fire. He will burn. Father and son are working together. Bard is using Bane's shoulder as a rest while he aims the black arrow for the one chink in Smog's armor. Smog is coming on with dreadful finality. Tell me, wretch, how now do you challenge me? You have nothing left but your death. The dragon's roar shakes the timbers and the marrow in their bones. He's coming on like the day of judgment. Bane turns to look at the advancing monster. Then a calm and reassuring voice says, Bane, Look at me. You look at me. The boy turns his gaze from the nightmare to his father's loving face, and my heart sees myself in him, sees the answer to all my fears. I've watched this scene several times now, and I think of Jesus. This was the secret to his prayers. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Mark six forty one to 44 Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, 
Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. John eleven thirty eight to 44 Jesus is not looking up like a man trying to recall something he just forgot. He looks up to heaven to fix his attention on his Father's loving face. He is orienting himself to what is most true in the world, not the impossibly inadequate resources for the need of the 5,000, not the sisters' grief, they were his dear friends, not even the finality of death sealed with a stone rolled over the tomb. He turns his gaze from all that evidence and fixes it upon his Father God and the resources of his kingdom. We know that faith plays a critical role in effective praying, maybe the critical role. And so we feel that somehow we have to generate faith. That never works, nor does it help to try and generate feelings of faith. We must look from the debris to God. Peter looks at Christ and he can walk on the water. He looks at the waves and he goes down. Agnes Sanford was a woman with a remarkable gift of physical healing. Many miracles were confirmed at her hands. I found it extremely insightful that when praying for sick children, she would often ask the parents to leave the room. The reason being that the fears and anxieties of the parents were actually getting in the way of effective prayer. Just as anxiety gets in the way of a good night's sleep, just as anger gets in the way of a reconciling conversation, the parents were fixed upon their child's suffering, and therefore they were impotent in prayer. Agnes fixed upon God, and her prayers were mighty. Before we can learn the prayer of intervention, we must clarify who we are and who we are praying to or with. For as we saw with Elijah, effective prayer is far more a partnership with God than it is begging him to do something. God. I am using a computer to write this book. It sits on my desk in my home office. The wallpaper on my computer, the background image that fills the entire screen, is a gorgeous photo of a piece of ocean and rugged coastline in Ireland. Our family spent an idyllic summer holiday there. One look at this photo and I am reminded of everything I know to be true about God. He is the creator of everything I love. Waterfalls, mountains, wild places, rivers, forests, sunshine, the night sky, beauty, goodness, truth. Just start there. Think of all the things you love in this world. And then remind yourself that the God you are praying to is the one who made them all. It helps me to hold and touch and feel something in the natural world, a leaf, a stone. I love placing them on the palm of the surface of the flowing water of a stream and reminding myself, God did this. He is immensely powerful, creative, generous, and intimate. You are talking to an immensely powerful, creative, generous, and intimate person when you talk to God. With my great power and outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are on it. Jeremiah 27, 5. I'll pause sometimes and wonder over the eye of our golden retriever or one of our horses. The eye is utterly astounding. It enables you to see for heaven's sakes. But it is also elegant and exquisitely made with the dapple-colored beauty of the iris, the pupil so deep and mysterious like the pools of Heshbon as Solomon captured it. In Song 7 verse 4, the eye of a horse is so large, it is startling. Its pupil so deep, it looks like you could view the kingdom of God in it. Like the hermit's pool in C.S. Lewis's The Horse and His Boy. 
and despite all its achievements, science has not been able to make a lens that can do what the eye can do. Then I think of the sunlight that enables our eyes to take in the beauty of the world around us. Isn't sunlight wonderful? I'm one of those folks easily affected by seasonal mood disorder. A few cloudy days and I'm feeling a bit overcast myself. Then the sun breaks out and bathes the world in gold, and I'm happy as a leprechaun. Don't you just love the sun? The way it causes the night to flee, and the grass to grow, and the trees to leaf out, the flowers to burst into bloom? Don't you love the way it warms you after a plunge into a cold pool or stream? I'm trying to remind myself just who this person is that I'm praying to. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. Psalm 19, verses 4 to 6. God gave us the sun. This ought to answer any doubts about his power and goodness. All life on this planet derives its life from the sun, that celestial nuclear device with a surface temperature of 5,500 degrees Celsius. Our mothers told us never to look directly at the sun, but when you sneak a peek, it appears to be the diameter of a pencil eraser. Yet more than a million Earths could fit inside the sun. Inconceivable amounts of energy are generated at its core as hydrogen converts to helium by nuclear fusion. One solar flare releases more energy than 10 million volcanoes. This is helping me realize God is powerful enough for whatever need I am praying over. Now get this. There are roughly 100 billion stars of all sizes in a galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the universe, which means there are approximately 400 billion billion suns like ours that God has made. If you began counting to that number today, you could not finish the task in your lifetime. Meanwhile, God is providing the energy of those suns every moment. J.B. Phillips nailed the predicament of too many Christians. Your God is too small. Words seem ridiculous at this point, but let us say clearly, Power is not an issue with God. His resources are unlimited. Is this the person you have in mind as you pray? You must turn your gaze in the direction of God or something that reminds you just who he is. One of the reasons I love flying over the ocean is that it speaks to me of the vast abundance of God. The transatlantic flight from Miami to Johannesburg is 17 hours. Hours and hours spent passing over the vast expanse of the ocean. Think of the volume of water down there. Like 400 billion billion suns, this was the very lesson Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples. Drive home with visual impact. When he fed the 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes, his resources are unlimited. I also need to remind myself that God reigns. One of the subtle crippling effects of an internet world is that we are aware of every atrocity within moments of its occurrence any place in the world. The earthquake that killed hundreds of thousands in Haiti, the millions of children in the sex trade. Such news is not benign. It has an effect on us. The evil one pounces, poisoning our confidence that a good and loving God is in control. As a friend said at lunch yesterday, it takes everything to believe that God exists and that he's good. And he was simply talking about the pain in one person's life. David described this tension in the Psalms. The people around him were freaking out over the ISIS of their day. He countered by stubbornly clinging to what he knew was true of God. Psalm 11, verses 1 to 4. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. 
the Lord is on his heavenly throne. He refused to let current events move him from the eternal fact that God reigns. The kingly reign of the Lord God Almighty is the still point of the turning world, to borrow T.S. Eliot's beautiful phrase. It is the fixed point of the scriptures. Psalm 93 verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. I think my heart's need to be assured of this is the reason I love this description of Jesus. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Hebrews 1 verse 3. Or, as the New Living Translation says, He sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command. Look, if God were to lose control of the worlds he made, nature would be collapsing into utter chaos all around you. Planets would be colliding, earthquakes would be leveling civilization, matter itself would be coming unglued. Scientists still have no idea what holds all matter together. Someone is holding this all together, sustaining it by his command. The sun came up again this morning. I am able to breathe because oxygen is still in generous supply. The law of gravity is still in effect. The ocean is still filled with water. Matter is still being held together. If the enemy had truly gained the upper hand, we would all be dead by now and the earth would be an ashen wasteland. The fact that you are here reading this book right now in this moment with your eyes working and your mind perceiving the room filled with air and the ground beneath you fixed in place is proof enough that God maintains control over the universe. Who are you praying to? Is he adequate? Is he kind? Is he in a good mood? Where is he located? Is he near or far away? Sometimes I catch myself praying to the sky god, thinking he is somewhere up there, above us, beyond the wild blue yonder. This sneaks into our assumptions, like Bet Midler sang, God watches us from a distance. It might sound reverent, but it is disheartening. He seems so far away. I know the Bible speaks of God enthroned in the heavens, but we have projected our own ideas into that and assumed that means way up there somewhere. Yet scripture presents them right at your elbow. Acts seventeen twenty seven and 28. He is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. God is near. He is close. He's all around us. I like letting other translations deepen and enrich my understanding. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. We live and move in him. Can't get away from him. That's the message version. He's not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and exist. New Living Translation. So when Thomas A. Kempis said, When Jesus is near, all is well and nothing seems difficult. When he is absent, all is hard. I believe what he meant was, when we are aware of how near Jesus is, all is well and nothing seems difficult. When he seems absent, all is hard, for he never ever leaves us. That is why the old priests urged us to fix your mind on the Most High and pray unceasingly to Christ. Most of all, above every other reminder, as you turn your gaze to God in prayer, what is your heart's conviction on his heart? Is he loving? Oh, how it helps me to remind myself, I am praying to the one who gave his life for me. When we look to the stormy seas of our circumstances to try and assure ourselves God is loving, we are fighting a losing battle. That is why we have to go to the true fixed point in the universe, the man hanging in execution on Calvary's hilltop. Romans 5, 6-8 
You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This resolves the issue in a way nothing else can remotely touch or settle. You should not, must not, please, please do not evaluate the loving kindness of God toward you by the swirling tornado of events, especially by whether or not he seems to be answering the prayer at hand. Your heart cannot take such abuse. You will find yourself swirling around like Dorothy in a Kansas cyclone, debris flying this way and that. It will leave you exhausted, uncertain, fearful, and desolate after a few months, let alone years. I am praying to the one who gave his life for me. Just let your heart linger there for a moment. Picture the event in your mind. I am praying to the one who gave his life for me. You will feel confidence in talking to him. Assurance that he cares more about what you care about than you do. Parents, do you feel that God loves your children more than you do? Or your friends, your dearest? If this was the person I clearly had in mind, clearly in my heart as I prayed, I know it would make a world of difference. I would be so confident. I would expect good things. I would feel triumphant right from the start. And that is why we are urged to fix our eyes on Jesus, especially as we pray. This immensely powerful, creative, generous, intimate, and loving person also happens to be your father. Which brings us to our situation in the prayer relationship. And you? A man I counseled years ago described his childhood with such a stark image it stayed with me like a metaphor. The story went like this. His father was a very successful man. He left for work before the boy woke in the morning and returned home just in time for dinner. After their rather efficient meal, his father would disappear behind a closed door into his home office, working there late into the night. This was his daily routine. The boy, longing for his father's affection, would sit in the hallway outside his father's office, writing little notes to his father and pushing them under the crack in the door. I always hoped that one time, just once, he would pass a note back under the door to me, but he never did. A heartbreaking story, but an even more heartbreaking metaphor, for this is how many people conceive of their relationship with God. A busy man they hate to bother, whose affection they long for, passing their prayers under his door, hoping for just a word in return. Honestly, when I listen to people pray, and nothing reveals your true beliefs like how you pray, more often than not it sounds like an orphan crying for mercy outside the gates. God, please, please help me. Just as we have to be careful to keep in mind exactly who it is we are praying to, what our images of God actually are, it is equally important to keep clear who we are in this process. Who are you to God? What is your relationship to the one to whom you pray? How do you conceive of it? Set aside your doctrine for a moment. What is your heart's settled assurance on the matter? I said earlier that tectonic shifts have taken place in the universe since the Psalms were written. Those shifts have forever changed your status with God and with his kingdom. Romans 8 verse 15 For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 4-7 but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. 
So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Yes, yes, we have all heard that we are God's children. We are sons and daughters. The curse of familiarity with the words has dulled us to the staggering truth they contain. The reality of it has not penetrated our hearts, not deeply enough. We still act and pray like orphans or slaves. A slave feels reluctant to pray. They feel they have no right to ask, and so their prayers are modest and respectful. They spend more time asking forgiveness than they do praying for abundance. They view their relationship with reverence, maybe more like fear, but not with the tenderness of love, of being loved. There is no intimacy in the language or their feelings. Sanctified unworthiness colors their view of prayer. These are often good servants of the Lord. An orphan is not reluctant to pray. They feel desperate, but their prayers are more like begging than anything else. Orphans feel a great chasm between themselves and the one to whom they speak. Abundance is a foreign concept. A poverty mentality permeates their prayer lives. They ask for scraps. They expect scraps. But not sons. Sons know who they are. Mine were just home for Christmas, all three of them. They are young men now, out making their way in the world. And, as is fitting to their stage of life, they are living on limited means. But when they come home, they get to feast. Their refrigerator and pantry are theirs to pillage, and they don't have to ask permission. When we go out to dinner, there is no question that Dad will take care of the bill. For they are sons. They get to live under their father's blessing. They get to drink from the abundance of my house. Psalm 36, 8. And when the holidays were over and they packed up and left, they took with them my best shoes, my best sunglasses, some of my favorite books, climbing gear and cigars, with my absolute pleasure and blessing. Luke was the last to go. He was hoping to pillage some of my travel gear for an upcoming trip. I said, you are my son. Everything I have is yours. Plunder as you will. This is how sons get to live. This is how a father feels toward his sons. With that in mind, listen to Jesus reframe our understanding of prayer. First, he uses a metaphor like the story I just gave you about my sons. It is a story about a wayward son who breaks his father's heart by wandering off into a life of hedonism and self-destruction. Read this as if he were talking about you, for this is your story. After he'd gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all over that country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, All those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I am going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got up and went home to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to his servants. Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. Luke fifteen, fourteen to 24 First off, did you notice the mentality of the son? Did you hear the orphan and slave in him? He has a prayer speech all figured out. Orphans and slaves make prayer speeches. They don't expect a two-way intimacy. Notice that his speech begins, 
I don't deserve. But now look at things from the father's point of view. How can he see his son from a long way off unless he was first looking for his son? He can't see the boy from inside the house behind a closed door. He must have been out on the porch searching the horizon for the first glimpse of the returning boy. Do you come to prayer knowing that God is already expecting you, looking for you with longing? The father runs to his son, embraces him, kisses him. This is how the father feels about you. The embrace, the kiss, all of it. I want to come to my father in prayer, expecting an embrace. Don't you? Of course, the older brother is upset by such lavish, scandalous generosity. And the truth of our position with God is so lavish and so scandalous. As the story continues, the father goes outside to assure him, My son, everything I have is yours. Verse 31. Luke, everything I have is yours. Sons and daughters, everything God has is yours. Is that how you pray? On the night of his arrest, Jesus wanted to make sure his disciples understood this as well. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you. John sixteen twenty three to 27 He said, Look, you don't need for me to ask on your behalf. My Father, who is now your Father, loves you. And how does the Father love us? I have made you, Father, known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. John seventeen twenty six. The Father loves you like he loves Jesus. Is this in your mind and heart as you come to prayer? You are not an orphan. You are not merely a servant of God. You are a son or daughter, and with that comes privileges. But when the time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Galatians 4, 4 4-5 I doubt any of us have tapped into that yet. The full rights as a son or daughter. Oh my! I have friends who pray with such confidence, and to be honest, their prayers are seeing greater results than mine. I think so much of it has to do with expectation. They are expecting the lavish and the scandalous. Friends and Allies We are moving in this book toward an entirely different way of praying. To prepare ourselves, we are reconceiving what our thoughts of God are like and how we see ourselves in the relationship. Dallas Willard said that we ought to look at our lives with God as a partnership, not as needy coming to the Lord of the universe hoping for some help, but as partners in a shared mission. This is how Jesus wanted us to see it. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. John fifteen thirteen to 15 Not only are you a son or daughter, you are also a friend of God, his confidant, his ally in bringing about his work on this earth. By way of example, Take healing prayer and the laying on of hands. We are instructed in James, in Hebrews, and by example in many other places, that for physical healing we are to lay hands on someone and pray for him. Now, why is that? Is it merely a gesture of kindness or comfort? No doubt it is both kind and comforting. But that is not why we are instructed in this procedure. Recall the story with the woman with the issue of blood. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak 
and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Luke 8, 42-46 She was healed through physical contact because as Jesus felt, power has gone out from me. That is the purpose for laying on of hands so that the power of God can flow through you to the sick person's body. Yes, healing can come in other ways, but it primarily comes through the laying on of hands, illustrating how we are partners with God in prayer. His power is available. The need is there. What is needed is a conduit, a vessel through which God can work. We see the same partnership idea in the story of Ananias praying for Saul, who would soon become Paul. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Acts 9 Verses 10 to 19. The God of 400 billion billion sons could certainly give Paul back his sight. Zap. But he insisted on using Ananias. What I love about the story is not only the miracle, but the relationship Ananias has with Jesus. Notice his comfort level in arguing with Jesus about the plan. You get the impression Ananias and Jesus are friends comrades, partners in this young revolution called Christianity. What are you looking at? It is human nature to look at the problem before us, the crisis that has caused us to pray, but the problem is exactly the thing we should not be looking at. You will want to have something before you that helps you turn your gaze from the wreckage to God. I respect the Orthodox Church's use of icons. They are not meant to be understood as pictures of Jesus, but rather more like symbols that help the believer turn his or her attention to him. Better than looking at the stain in the carpet or the tiles on your ceiling. What will help you keep your eyes fixed on the truth of God? C.S. Lewis had only one picture on the walls of his bedroom, a photo of the image of Jesus' face from the Shroud of Turin. He would gaze upon it as he prayed. I believe that as we grow in fixing our gaze on Jesus, we can learn to turn our inner eyes to him and actually see him. As Pascal said, it is the heart which experiences God. But I am not that proficient at that. So I have kept a journal in front of me, not a diary, but a journal of key truths I must remind myself of on a daily basis. That he is the God of 400 billion billion sons, the creator of everything I love. That I am his son. I have the full rights of a son. It helps me get into the right frame of mind as I pray. But you may be thinking, I try to think of myself as a son or daughter of a good and loving father when I pray. It doesn't seem to change the results. This can be disheartening. But remember, 
We are not sitting on the back porch with our papa drinking lemonade. We are heirs to the throne, joining our Father and Jesus on the field of battle. An invasion is underway.